Though released in 2008, Mirror's Edge is a game that I'd only ever heard of but had never actually seen any footage of it until 2021. Being a former graphic designer who now makes his living doing film analysis, I couldn't help when I played this game that there was a lot more going on in Mirror's Edge than just running and jumping. The anti-technocracy streak in the game is pretty obvious at the plot level, but there's plenty else going on at the level of detailed intricacy. However, given the fast-paced speedrunning nature of the gameplay and the block-coloured visual simplicity of the level designs, most players will never hang about in one place long enough to notice all these subtleties. Just like most people won't see most of the textures in the game because the textures can only really be seen up close. So I recently recorded a very slow-paced sightseeing playthrough where I mostly just hung around looking at the fine details in each level of the Mirror's Edge world. And here are 20 of the most interesting things I found. I might comment here and there on why I find these things interesting, but mostly I'll let you ponder over the potential meanings for yourself. Number 1. Colourless Foliage The foliage in this game is always grey. Every potted plant, every tree, I didn't find any green foliage in this game at all, even though green is used as a pink colour in many of the world's artificial settings. Is all of the foliage just artificial? Number 2. Colourless Wood This is related to the first point. Wood is used as a construction material in many of the environments of the set, and we can see it a lot when we go into environments that are only partially built. But it's always white or grey, never brown. In fact, brown is an almost completely absent colour in this world, as if by design. Number three, government approved paint. All of the paintings laying about in the partially constructed and partially decorated locations have government approved written on them. Why would you need the government to approve what paint you use? Number four, the janitor's room. In one of the levels, the player has to enter this little room to progress further. The janitor has left notes referring to this as his office, but it's more like a prison cell. The janitor, who we don't actually get to see, has a pet rat in a cage, and he has some interesting scribbled artwork on his walls, including his love for the rat that he keeps prisoner, what appears to be a fantasy of being able to smash down symbolic doors like the player can do, and an employee of the month certificate which he has awarded to himself. Number five, barcode plates. The vehicles in this world don't have license plates, they have barcodes. Now, a human eye wouldn't be able to identify a vehicle in this way, but automated scanners would. Number six, on one of the worker's computer screens can be found a long email, which you have to get pretty close to read. And the guy talks about knowing someone who took part in a free speech rally, and so he was worried that he'll be branded guilty by association. And at the end, he says, quote, it's not like they can tie me to a chair and beat me up for quitting my job, end quote. But near the end of the game, we see a toppled chair and spilled blood in an interrogation room. I wonder if that's blood from the guy who wrote this email, in red. Number seven, tiny distant people. Aside from cutscene animations, there are very few instances in this game of the player coming across everyday civilians. This is about the closest view of everyday people that we get. The enemies mostly have their faces covered, and no doubt the lack of civilians would reduce the budget of the game because they wouldn't have to animate lots of human-looking faces. But is this also symbolic? When civilians are shown, they are always far away and look so insignificant among the giant buildings that they may as well be ants. Even their moving vehicles are usually so far away they may as well be mice in a maze. Number 8. Anti-Running Campaign the player is part of a network of people opposed to technocracy and they're called runners for obvious reasons. But the city officials' fear of people moving about freely extends way beyond this, as is evident in this elevator news headline discouraging even children from running. Number 9, and this is part of the same elevator broadcast, it says, quote, Is your radio transmitting secret messages? End quote. What the hell is that all about? Number 10, the New Eden Shopping Mall. The Garden of Eden is a biblical paradise, of course, and here we have a shopping mall version of it that's due for a grand opening. Number 11, continuing with the same location, whilst most of the game features signs written in English with occasional bits of Chinese, making it difficult to know if this game is set in the West or the East, and I think that's part of the point, here we have a Russian translation of the phrase grand opening. So we have all three of the world's major powers present in this city's written languages. It's like they've all blended into one. 
Number 12, the Shard Building. This is the headquarters from which the technocratic city is monitored, and its shape is reminiscent of Magritte's surrealist artwork, where smooth buildings blend into the sky. There's plenty more going on with the interior and exterior of this building, for example, the thematically ice-cold designs of the upper levels. Now before we move on folks, if you're enjoying this quick little study and you want to see more gaming studies, then you might want to make note to watch the following game analysis videos which are available on my channels and are linked in the video description below and in the comments section. Well at least they will be if I remember to put them there. We've got the psychological appeals of Doom. I've only done part one of that but I've got enough material to expand that to about another eight or nine parts. We've got the psychological appeals of Skyrim, which is an expansive analysis, several hours long, and in three parts so far. We've got Far Cry 5, The Cult of the Protagonist, which is a, an analysis on the, uh, the story of that game. It has some very interesting features. And funnily enough, at the very time of me writing this video, Far Cry 6 has just been released last night here in the UK. We've got a detailed analysis of the amazing groundbreaking puzzle game, The Witness, and I've got more videos to post in the near future on Mirror's Edge and some very in-depth studies of alien isolation coming up. So if you don't want to miss out on those, then make sure to subscribe and click the notification bell to ensure that you know when those new releases have been put out. Or better still, go to my website, collativelearning.com, bookmark it, and then check weekly for my latest new content updates. Right, let's get back to the Mirror's Edge list. Number 13. I can't recall any instances of it being cloudy in this game. Where have all the clouds gone? Where are the weather systems? Number 14, Mr. Tronic Home Security Boxes. These boxes are found stored and laying about in various locations in the game. I assume it's surveillance cameras inside. Are these for home security, as it says on the box, or is this a sneaky surveillance invasion of the buyer's home? Number 15, flags in the city are virtually always a single block colour, National flags are nowhere to be seen. Number 16. This piece of corporate artwork near the top of the Shard building looks like a chemical structure. If it is, what's the chemical? Is it about the worship of chemistry, or is it something else? Number 17. Nature magazines. These are laying about in lots of locations, usually on office desks, despite the fact that there is very little actual nature in the Mirror's Edge world. In fact, one of these magazines, it sits in the janitor's office right next to an out-of-order sign, which I found kind of poignant. It seems like many of the residents in this city have a longing for nature. Number 18, another elevator news story. This one is asking whether avian flu is here to stay. There was a reported outbreak of this bird disease when the game was being made, and birds flying away are also an occasional feature in the levels. Number 19, as is often the case in real life, the corporate art in this game is incredibly basic and conceptually empty. The kind of art which invites the viewer to inject their own meaning because the artist has nothing interesting to actually show. However, there are occasions in which these corporate modern art displays clearly are trying to portray a childlike love of the city's industrial design. And lastly, in the menu screens of the game, a red banner is remarkably similar to the in-game red doors that the player smashes through to progress through levels. I don't know why, but it was only my second playthrough of the game that I had finally made that connection. Well, anyway, there you go, folks. There's a lot more to explore in the world design of Mirror's Edge. This video was merely an introduction, and I have lots more notes on it for future videos. Make sure to check out the links to my other video game analysis videos in the video description below and in the comments section. If you want more content, then do subscribe and click that notification bell, otherwise you won't know about my newest updates. And be sure to visit my website as well, where I have dozens of hours of additional analysis content that's not available on YouTube. You've been listening to Rob Ager. Stay free.